How many enjoyed getting your groove on this morning? A little bit, right? That was good stuff. It got me moving. Well, uh, hopefully you guys will take a look at that. I know that uh, looking at that list, you can kind of grow glassy-eyed, but this is how simple it is, honestly. Uh, I've been um, uh, wanting to start a, a mountain bike group because I enjoy that, and uh, Jared Atchison's co-worker, um, I don't know if he's here. I doubt he's watching online. Are you here, John? Probably not. I've invited him, but he's turned me down many times. Uh, but we, we've found this connection. Jared's been working on this guy um, that uh, is at his work for about five years, just trying to share the gospel, uh, share Christ with him, and come to find out he enjoyed mountain biking. He's like, hey, one of my friends likes mountain biking. He left it out that I was a pastor. And uh, so we started mountain biking together, and there's been a couple times where him and I have just gone out and mounted bike and uh, gone out on the trails. And this last time I just told him, hey, I, we're starting this thing called shared interest groups at church uh, where we just get people that have similar hobbies just getting together, just going to do this. I'd like to do mountain biking. Would you ever want to ride with us? And he was like, ah, I don't know, you know. Later that night he texted me and said, hey, if you start that thing with your church, I'd be more than happy to come and ride with you boys. It's always a good time hitting the woods with you. So it's as simple as that. Just you like this, I like this, let's, let's hang out and do that. And so uh, I'm praying for him, and we're kind of tag-teaming this and, and believing that great things are going to come from this ministry. This is really, really could be key to reaching our community. It is good to be here this morning as we continue our series, Reclaiming the Table. Now, how many this week accepted my dad's challenge of last week of eating at least three family meals together with your whole family? Raise your hands. I want to see how many had at least three. Oh, is that really it? Three family meals this week. Oh, that's awesome. Well, if you missed out, what we're asking and we're challenging people to do is to reclaim the table. And last week, my dad talked about the family table and how there's an importance of, of spending time as a family around the table. Fifty years ago, the average time around a table was 90 minutes. Families would spend 90 minutes around the table. In today's culture, the average time around a meal is 12 minutes. We have got to reclaim the table. We've got to use that time to have discussions, to pray together, to grow together, to disciple our children, to challenge, encourage, and support one another, to set the phones down, look one another in the eye, and actually have meaningful conversations. And so we are challenging you with that. And as a little motivation, we've started a little competition, or, or uh, I should not competition, but um, uh, a contest where if you document your family sitting at the table and you take a picture of it and on social media or you send it to the church, you put hashtag NH table, which simply just is a neat way of organizing all of those pictures on the internet, then you will be entered to win one of a uh, hy hy gift card for $100. And this past week, the winner was Brittany Cooley. Uh, Brittany Marie Cooley, so I don't know if she's here or if she's working in the nursery today, but uh, she posted a picture, and there was over 100 people that participated in that this week, and so we want to keep on getting those hashtags. So this week, the batch starts over, the lottery starts over, document your, your table experience. I documented mine. We were able to have several uh, meals this week. If you want to throw that first uh, picture of my daughter, Essie, she's our youngest, this, uh, this was at breakfast time. I thought I put the bowl of yogurt a little bit farther out of reach, and I went in the other room to grab something. I came back, and she got to it. This next picture is also of Essie. She loves eating, and that's her way of saying, I'm all done, Dad. Uh, no more. Uh, and then before you throw up this next picture, oh, go, that's fine. That, you can throw it up. Last night we were making uh, meatloaf, and uh, I was helping Elizabeth in, in the kitchen, and my neighbor came over and said, hey, do you have a tool that I could borrow? I said, yeah, it's down in my basement. Let me go get it. Well, I came down to the basement to find my daughter with a whole bunch of markers out. And she was just coloring all over herself. And that picture's not even really do it justice. It was everywhere. You can see she even tried to paint her toenails on her left foot there. Um, and I've never seen such murky, dark, black water in a bath <laughs> ever. Um, and so all because of the meal, and then this next picture is a picture of some pho. How many have ever had pho? It's a Vietnamese dish. It's really good. Thank you, Ken Van Milligan and James Crosby, for the tips of how to make this delicious uh, soup bone beef pho. 
And my dad came over, we invited him over, and he's gobbling down this soup, and he goes, mm, this is very European, I love it. And we're like, not quite <laughs> Vietnamese. I'm not sure what to do with that. Um, but we have made some great memories, my family, this week around the table, and uh, we really want you guys to, to focus in on this. Put your screens away. I'll be the first to admit it is really difficult for me to unplug and not answer all the text messages that come through or I think of something that I didn't accomplish in the day, so I'm trying to make a more concentrated effort to have and reclaim this table. So uh, turn in your Bibles to, to Luke chapter 14, and t- today... Uh, we are going to be talking about the community table. If you read the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you would know and you would recognize that a lot of Jesus' ministry revolved around a table. A lot of his teachings, a lot of the discussions that he had were around the table. A lot of the times that he was trying to reach people that were lost and hurt and broken were around the table. Evangelism is oftentimes a, is, is a good Excuse me, the table is a good place for evangelism to happen. And why is that? It's because there is a common ground around the table. Everyone has to eat, and so it doesn't matter what you believe, what you look like, what you think like. When we come over a meal and we break bread together, we can share this one thing in common. That I am hungry and you are hungry. That you need energy and I need energy. And so the table is the perfect place to take people in completely two different places of life and to come together and say, let's unify over food. Jesus was very good at at doing this. I want you to take inventory this morning. When was the last time that you intentionally used a mealtime to reach your lost friend, your coworker, relative, or your neighbor? When was the last time that you intentionally broke bread with someone that believed differently than you. That was not a part of the family of God. At the end of my message, the response I'm asking for is this, that every one of you would reach out to someone who needs Jesus in their life, and you would schedule a time. You'd create space out of your time, and you would say, let's dine together, let's eat together. And during that meal time, I want you to look for an opportunity to share your faith to that person and share about Jesus with that person. God is going to lay people on your heart that are lost, that need, that are open. The, the scripture says that, that the, heart, the, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. It's a ripe season right now. We are the church. We need to, to really reclaim this community table. Some of you might be thinking, well, how schemy and unsincere is it for you to invite someone over with an agenda? Okay, listen, the business world is better at winning others over than we are. You are put on this planet for one purpose, and that's to bring as many people with you to Jesus as you possibly can. You don't need to feel ashamed if a spiritual conversation comes up sharing a meal. You don't need to be embarrassed about that. People will respect you for your convictions. We claim that Jesus is everything, and we claim that there's a heaven and a hell, but most of us don't live with this urgency that reflects our belief. Let's reclaim the community table and bring eternal purpose to it. So hopefully you've made it to Luke chapter 14 and where we pick up Jesus is eating with some of the religious leaders of the time. And in verse 15, he says this. When one of those at the table with him heard this, he said to Jesus, blessed is the the one who will eat at at the feast of the kingdom of God. Jesus replied, a certain man was preparing a great banquet and invited many guests. At the time of the banquet, he sent his servant to tell those who had been invited, Come, for everything is now ready. But they all alike began to make excuses. The first said, I have just bought a field and I must go see it. Please excuse me. Another said, I have just bought five yoke of oxen and I'm on my way to try them out. Please excuse me. Still another said, I just got married so I can't come. The servant came back and reported this to him, the master, reported this to his master. Then the owner of the house became angry and ordered his servant, go out quickly into the streets and the alleys of the town and bring in the poor, the crippled, the blind, and the lame. Sir, the servant said, what you ordered has been done, but there is still room. Then the master told his servant, go out to the roads and country lanes and compel them, bring them in 
to, to, my fam, or to my house so that my house may be full. I tell you, not one of those who are invited will get a taste of my banquet. God, I pray this morning as I speak, God, that you'd continue to lay people on my heart so that everyone here would leave with someone that you are ready, that you are priming, that you are preparing the way for us to reach through your power, God. And so I just pray that, that names would begin to drop in the hearts of everyone here, that our ears would be open, our hearts would be open, and uh, that we would leave here walking in obedience. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, amen. 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 So in reading this text, there's several things that I want to point out to you. The first is that Jesus often would speak through parables or stories so that the audience that he was talking to wouldn't understand what he was talking about. And so there's several different characters in this story that Jesus is talking about that represent who, God is, or who Jesus was trying to talk about. In verse 16, Jesus refers to a certain man. In verse 21 and 23, this certain man is called a master and the owner of the house. The master in this story represents God. The servants represent God's people, which would be anyone who is a Christian and falls under to the lordship of Jesus Christ. So that would be you. That would be me. We are um, identifying with the servants in this story. And it's important to remember in this time period, servants weren't slaves. They, they, they were often part of the family. They were even heirs at times. And so these servants lived under the house and the protection and the blessings of the master. And the final um, type of people that we see in this story is, is those who are invited to this great banquet. And those people, the invited, represent those who are not yet in a relationship with God. So let's take a look at the master first. And the first thing we see is that he is a generous master. In verse 16, it said, Jesus says this, the master was preparing a great banquet and invited many guests. Now, I've been invited to a lot of meals. I've been invited to social gatherings, to parties, to graduation parties, to a lot of different things. And one of the things, and let me hear an amen if this is true, one of the things that can make or break a party is the food. Amen. Dude, how many walk into a party and you see the spread of food and you're like, thank you, Jesus. Let's go, baby. You know, like that food can make or break the party. And here is this master. He's preparing this great banquet. <clears throat> Man, I've been to some graduation parties where they cater in Smokey D's. They cater in Jethro's. They bring in, in uh, Hickory Park. And I'm like, oh, let's go. You did so good at graduating high school. I'm so thankful that you graduated, you know? <clears throat> and I think you can kind of look at this at two ways. You can look at this like, what a waste, you know? It's not even that big of an accomplishment. They make it impossible to fail. And, and what a waste of, of, of resources and money, you know? And you can walk away just talking about how wasteful. Or you can walk away and say, man, what a blessing that was. How, what, how generous was that of the individual for their kid and for their friends and their family to say, come, let's celebrate, let's eat. Let, we're doing it all on my dime. That's the side that I want to err on. I want to be appreciative of that. I want to trust the intention of the person that is being generous, that they're not just trying to be generous to keep up with the Jones. They're doing it out of the goodness of their heart. We serve a God who gives us his best the master in this story who represents God is spending his time, his energy, and resources to make this a great banquet. Why? Because he is generous and he wants to bless those who will accept his invitation. If you're unsure of where you stand at with God, I just want to remind you that he wants to spend more time blessing you than he wants to spend forgiving you. Our God is a generous God. He has given everything in the free gift, and all he's wanting you to do is just to say, yes, I receive it. See, his generosity was Jesus dying on the cross for our sins in our place. And, and we see that he has given everything, and he's not, he's not even saying, you come to me and you do this, and you do this, and you do this. It's a free gift. Our God, our master, is the most generous person in the entire universe. He is the, the author of generosity. He is the inventor of generosity. He's the one we look to and we model our lives after. He simply wants us to be blessed. The second trait of the master is that he is not prejudiced. In verse 21, the master instructs his servants, bring in the poor, the crippled, the blind, and the lame. 
And then in verse 23, he instructs the servants to go to the roads and to the, the country lanes or to the highways and the byways and compel, beg them, bring them in. See, the master was not concerned with social status. He wasn't concerned with what the person looked like. He wasn't concerned with what they had to offer him. He wasn't even concerned about uh, identifying and and eating with the the social misfits or those deemed unclean. In fact, the invitation went out to the the, the outsides of the town, to the, the highways, the byways, the country roads, and these are the people that didn't believe like them. It's out of their their, their social sphere, out of, out of their um, uh, culture. The people out on the highways, they, they may have had different religions. They, they didn't even believe or act or think like the way that, that this person throwing the party was thinking. Remember, Jesus is sharing this story with religious leaders. Religious leaders, ask yourself, do you identify with this? These religious leaders believed that the Jews were the only people to receive God's mercy and grace. And they didn't want to extend what had been given to them to the Gentiles. The idea of a Roman or Samaritan or a Greek being part of the family of God was repulsive to them. They lived comfortably around the people that looked like them, that dressed like them, that thought like them, that talked like them, that behaved like them, that believed like them. That is who they were associating with. And Jesus is coming and ripping this down and saying, hold on, this is for everyone. Now I want to ask you a very pointed question. When was the last time that you invited someone to your house or out to eat who came from a very different background than you? Are you spending all your time around people who believe and think and look and act like you? When was the last time you were maybe a little uncomfortable because the person you were associating with was different than you? Back in August, Elizabeth and I we're traveling somewhere, and, and uh, we we're on the interstate, and I passed this man on the side of the interstate. He didn't have his hand out or anything, and I felt like, oh, man, I need to pick this guy up. And I was like, no. And then I was like, the Spirit just wouldn't let me not pick him up. And so I slam on my brakes, pull off to the side. I asked Elizabeth. It was just her and I in the car. I said, I really feel like I'm supposed to offer this guy a ride. I don't, I don't know why. Are, are you okay with that? Are you comfortable with this? I'm not going to bring in some dude if my wife is like, no, I'm really rather not at this time, right? And, and maybe it was just a little bit like, hey, you can get me out of the spirit conviction, Elizabeth, you know? <laughs> okay. So we pull over, and, and she's like, yeah, I'm good with that. So I back up about a quarter of a mile on the interstate, which I wouldn't recommend doing. I roll down my window. And I say, hey, man, where are you headed? And he goes, I don't know. I said, well, we're headed this way. Would you like to join us for the afternoon? I'll give you a ride. He said, sure. This man was dressed in all black, super baggy clothes. He had a slip knot shirt on. He had tattoos all over his hands and his fingers and his neck and piercings, a shaved head. He reeked of, of B.O. and I don't know if it was weed or cigarette or a combina- combination of the two. And he gets in the back of my truck, and I ask him, what's your name? He said, my name's Vinny. I said, well, where are you headed? And he goes, well, I'm trying to get to my sister in Florida. I don't really know where I'm going. I said, well, you can hang out with us. So I start to talk to him. I start to ask about his family. I start to ask about where he's coming from and how he got there and the decisions he made in his life. And eventually it led to a time where I was able to pray with him. And I, I got him a Bible and some new believers material. And, and I was able to give that to him. And as we prayed, tears are rolling down his face. And he's just visibly, visibly overwhelmed with the presence of God. And he asked me, he said, does it feel this good every time you pray? Does, does God always feel this good? If I wouldn't have gotten a little bit out of my comfort zone, would this man have ever experienced the presence of God in such a real and tangible way? Here's a man that is looking for his next high, that was looking for the next just place to go, lost and wondering, and here I was, I came, I was obedient, and I pray, and God delivered, and and brought that, he prayed the prayer of salvation, I dropped him off at at, at a a Greyhound bus stop in, in Osceola, and I think of him often, and I pray for him, 
I'll be the first to admit, it doesn't feel natural to hang out with people like Vinny. It doesn't feel natural to me to be around people that smell like weed. It doesn't feel natural for me to be around someone who is completely on a total different wavelength of thinking. And it's just like the worldview is just like, how can you even how can you even think those things? How can you even get to that place? It doesn't come natural. But the more I stretch myself, the more I grow comfortable with it. At my house, we've had all sorts of races and ethnicities over. I've had homosexuals over for dinner. I've had Muslims into my house. I've had agnostics and atheists. I've had all sorts of people. And I don't say that to brag, but I say that to challenge us. If we are to be salt and light to the world, then why not bring them onto our turf? When I bring them into my home, they are in a home court advantage for me. I get to pray because it's my house. I get to lead conversation because I am the one who has invited them. Listen, I, I, again, I hear my heart in this. I'm, I'm not trying to manipulate. I'm not trying to, to put down. But if we're going to be salt and light, we've got to do a better job at that. We have got to reclaim this community table. I pray that my house would be a dwelling place for the Lord. That when people that are coming in that are confused, bondage in sin and in darkness, that when they walk through the threshold, through my, my door frame of my house, that they would walk into the presence of God, that they would feel the presence of God, they would feel the lightness, that they would experience something that is so real and life-giving when they have been searching their entire lives for that. Are you willing to be a little bit uncomfortable? Are you prejudiced in who you're reaching out to? The second characters I want to focus on is the servants. Now remember, the servants represent anyone who could consider, who would consider themselves a Christian. In other words, they are under the lordship of the master. And the characteristic I want you to see is that they are on board with the mission of their master. When the master tells these servants to go out and invite people, the servant does it without complaint. He doesn't come up with an excuse or try to talk the master out of it or negotiate terms. The servant fulfills the task put before him. Sometimes I have to wonder just how sincere we are when we sing songs with words of Lord. When we sing songs of God, do what you want to. How sincere are we? we? We negotiate the tasks that he asks us to carry out. It feels like every day as a parent, I'm having to remind my kids that Elizabeth and I have the final say and authority in our household. How many parents understand what I'm saying? It's like, Paisley, go potty before bed. No! Paisley, disobeying is not an option. You will go potty. I don't want to! I didn't ask you if you wanted to. I'm telling you that you need to. Fine. She turns three tomorrow, and so we're officially in the three-nager years. <laughs> but there have been times in my life where I try to treat God like my kids try and treat me. Where when, when, when he nudges me or he tells me and commands me to do something, I take it more as a suggestion where I try to talk my way off the hook. I received a phone call this past Wednesday from a lady in our church of an incredible testimony, and she was, she was so excited to tell me this. And, and on Wednesday, she felt this urging sense to, to send this couple a text. Now, this couple had been involved in her life for many years, but she hadn't had contact with this couple for about two months. And so she hasn't really um, been in contact with these people, and, and she felt this urgency to send this text to this couple. Now, kind of a, a backstory of the couple. This couple is really struggling in their marriage. Things are not going well. This lady in our church was feeling just overwhelmed. She's got her family that she's running. She's got different people that she's trying to serve and help. And she gets this text, and she's like, God, I don't know if I can handle another set of someone's problems in this but she kept on feeling this urgency. So she sent both the husband and the wife a text and said, hey, I don't know what's going on, but you guys are on my heart and I feel this urgency to text you. If, if there's anything I can do or pray for, you know, let me know. Are you guys all right? Is everything okay? 
The wife responded and said that she was busy at work and couldn't talk but would call her later and fill her in. And about 10 minutes later, the husband texted back and he said this, you have no idea how much this text means to me. My wife told me that I have to decide between quitting my job and going to nine month intense rehab facility to get my issues and addictions under control or she was going to meet with a divorce lawyer on Friday. I had decided that I was going to tell my wife that I can't do it and that she'd have to divorce me. I haven't prayed in a couple years, but this morning I prayed and I asked God for a sign. I told God, if you want me to go, I want a text message from this person's name. I couldn't hardly believe it when you texted me. I went straight to my boss, I quit my job, I got online and paid the thousand dollar deposit for the treatment center, and I leave December 1st for treatment. Praise God for this miracle. Praise God that we have people that hear the voice of God and they're on board with the mission. That's a saved marriage. That's a little girl who doesn't have to grow up in a broken home. Are we on board with God's mission? I understand that there have to be boundaries and I understand that you've got to be well and that you need to be healthy in order to help others but let's not use the excuse like this lady in our church could have used of I've got my own set of issues or I've got so and so set of issues I can't handle one more thing on my plate God not today listen if God's going to lead you to someone he's going to lead you through it it's his power it's his spirit that does the work and I can't imagine the servants in this story, that the task would be an easy task. Go out and get the crippled and the lame and the diseased. Go out and get the poor and those who think differently. Look, at, compel them to come in. If you've got to buy an Uber donkey, then you get an Uber donkey and you get that person to my banquet because my house will be full. And we see obedience. We see that they were on board with the mission of God. The last characters from this story are those who are invited, and these people represent all who are not a part of God's family. These are unbelievers, people outside of the family of God. Now, being a college-age pastor is really difficult. I'm not going to stand up here and say that it's easy. When planning an event, I'll ask people, and nobody wants to commit to the event. I'll say, hey, what do you, what do you got going on Friday, are you going to make the event? I don't know my plans yet. I'll just have to see. I'm like, it's Thursday. Tomorrow's Friday. You don't know what your plans are. Why don't you make plans? So, well, who else is going to the event? Well, that's funny because 12 other people said who else is going to the event. Would you be the first one to RSVP so that I can tell those other 12 people that you're going to the event? It's the most frustrating thing in the world. How many are like me and you're just like, I'm a planner. Like, if you put it on the calendar, I'm just going to put it in my calendar. It's going to happen, and we're just going to move forward in this. But what I've come to understand in college ministry and in planning an event is that the only thing that I'm responsible for is the event itself and the invitation. I cannot make anybody RSVP. I cannot make anybody come and take what, is, uh, what I'm offering I can't force people to show up. That's on them. There is a difference between a, responsible, a responsibility for and a responsibility to people. And I've talked about this a lot because it's a big issue. We tend to bear burdens that were never meant for us to bear. We as God's servants should not feel responsible for the response of anyone invited to the table. In verse 18, the invited guests begin to make excuses. I just bought a field. I need to go see it. I just bought some oxen. I need to go tend them. I, j I just got married. My wife's got a DiGiorno in the oven. I got to go home, right? This story doesn't record this, but I can imagine that the crippled and, and the poor and the blind and the foreigners making excuse saying, I don't have anything to wear. I don't have anything to bring. My kind doesn't belong with your kind. People will judge me because I'm not like them. I don't believe like you believe. Man, there were people who were invited that were just plain unreceptive. The master extended the invitation. The servants compelled them to come in, 
But then we see that there were some that were just uninterested and apathetic towards the invite of the master. I want you to think, what would have happened if the master just accepted it as that? He could have had a, a victim mentality. Oh, well, return the hogs, return the cattle. Nobody's appreciative of what I was trying to do. And, and I put myself out here and I, I tried to do this great thing and, and nobody took me up on it. And he could have just, just stopped at that moment. But what we see is that he goes for more because he knows that there's a whole nother batch of people that haven't been invited yet that would be responsive and would be uh, open to that invitation. I want you to hear me. You are not responsible for the salvation of your coworker. You are not responsible for saving your neighbor. You are not responsible for saving your friend. You can't even save yourself. So stop putting so much pressure on the results of what you do. Back on September 15th, the college group met, and we had a total of three students and four leaders there. There were seven of us. I haven't had three students at a college-age meeting since the very first Wednesday in June of 2012. Two weeks later, on September 29th, we had a total of 34. There wasn't anything different about those two weeks, and if I become obsessed with the results, I begin to lose focus of why I do what I do. You know what I've realized and grown comfortable with? Is that God wants me to minister to three as much as he wants me to minister to 34, and God wants me to minister to 34 as much as he wants me to minister to to 1,000. I choose daily to walk in obedience, not based off of my results. I cannot make your college-age student want more of Christ. I cannot make anyone accept what I try and provide, but I will, without a shadow of a doubt, I will be rewarded someday for my obedience, not the results of my obedience. Let's be a church that is focused on obeying Christ and not letting the results of a rejection, of an invitation, or whatever it might be. Listen, I said this in the early service, it's not in my notes, but you going and responding in obedience and inviting someone could be just a nudge where they just move just a little bit closer to salvation. And even though it feels like a closed door and a failure for you, it's actually moving, excuse me, I'm puberty right now. It's actually, (laughs) it's actually moving them one step closer to salvation and they go from completely cold towards God to say, you know what, maybe there is God. This is like the third person this week that has told me about Christ. This is the third person that's invited me to church. Maybe God's trying to get my attention. Listen, your results are not your reward. Your reward is in heaven and your obedience. I believe that all of you have been getting nudges from the Holy Spirit of of who you need to share a meal with. And, And at the same time as the Spirit of God has just been moving and nudging your hearts and dropping names in your hearts, Satan has been trying to whisper little lies to you, saying your house isn't big enough or it's not clean enough. You don't have enough money to make a feast. You're a horrible cook. They'll make fun of you even more if they know what you stand for. They know that you're not perfect because they work with you. They won't listen to you about your God. You you can't tell them about it when they know that you struggle. Listen, if God can talk through a donkey in the Old Testament then God can talk through you. Stop giving your sin and your natural abilities so much credit. God is just looking for a willing vessel. He's just looking for a yes. He doesn't need your help. He doesn't need my help. He's just looking for someone to say, I heard what you said. I'm going to respond. You want an invitation. I'll give it. And the rest is up to you, Lord. That's all he's looking for. The size of your home doesn't matter. The quality of the food doesn't matter. What people remember most is whether or not you genuinely love and care for them. If they come through your home or you meet them at Starbucks or you meet them wherever, if if they feel your warmth and love and embrace of that, that is what they're going to remember. Listen, there's been more meaningful moments in my life shared over a piece of pie than there have been flame and yawn and lobster, although flame and yawn makes it really close. I mean, that really speaks my language. Hospitality is more important than environment. You guys hear me. Hospitality is more, stop disqualifying yourself from this. 
Some of you have a beautiful home, and, and maybe you'd be up to opening it. You're like, I'm really not a good talker, or, or you know, I, I don't really know how to start. You've got this home, but you, you, you love to cook, or maybe you just love to entertain. The gift of hospitality is one of the best spiritual gifts because it opens up people's hearts and opens up a door for God's spirit and his truth and his love to come in. If you've got a home, if you're an empty nester, if you've got a place to entertain, we need host homes for our small groups. Let's reclaim that community table. Talk to Pastor Kerry if that's resonating with you in your spirit right now. Are you on board with the mission of God? Are you willing? Now in just a moment, we're going to have some time to pray about who to invite over or go out to eat with. You're going to check your calendar, and we're all going to leave here with a plan of action, meaning I'm calling all of us to participate. In the next month, I want you to find time, to create time in your space, in your schedule. Create space in your schedule for a time where you can share a meal with someone who needs Jesus. And I want to give you two practical questions that you can ask that will stir up um, spiritual conversation. Because how many know it's kind of weird where it's like, oh, this is really good. Oh, did you see the Yankees got knocked out of the playoffs? By the way, Jesus died on the cross for your sins. And, you know, this and this. You know, and that segue can just kind of be a little bit intimidating of how do we move from surface to the inner core of who we are. How many, how many have ever felt that tension where it's like, how do I, how do I get from a one to a ten? You know, how do, I, how do I get in that? And this is the first and easiest question to, to ask. And I hope you take notes, take a picture of these two questions. Say, hey, John, hey, Susie, what's the best thing that has ever happened to you in your life? And most of the time they say, oh, probably the day I met my, my spouse or the day I got married or the day I graduated college or the day I won the high school football uh, championship back in 1987 when I could throw a pigskin over their mountains, you know, or whatever it is. And, and they, they bring up this joyous occasion in their life and almost without fail, they'll turn around and ask you the same question. And what you've done is you have, you have invited and, and, and created this way for them to ask you what the greatest thing has ever happened in your life and what you get to do in that moment is share your faith. They're not asking you to preach at them. You're not asking them to have a conversion moment. It's just saying, you know what, I'm glad you asked me that because the best thing that's ever happened to me is when I asked Jesus Christ into my life. I've had a lot of great things. I've got a wonderful wife, a beautiful family. I've got all these different things that have happened in my life. But honestly, the most peace I've experienced, the most joy I've, I've experienced is when Jesus Christ entered my life. And it's just as simple as that. And that will start to stir up in their minds the sense of questioning and wondering and, and wrestling with, am I eternally okay? You know, the, the spirit will just begin to move with that question. The second and easiest way is to ask, is there anything I can pray for you while I bless my meal? Is there anything I can pray for you when I bless my meal? I believe that God wants to answer prayers for your friends through you. How cool would it be if we started praying for our coworkers or the people that we go out to, to lunch with, and then two hours later they get a call, hey, my son's temperature went down. Thanks for praying. Hey, you remember that, that cousin of mine that had cancer? The report just came back, cancer-free. I believe that God wants to do miraculous things if we can offer up a prayer in faith that we have a God who has an invitation that wants his house to be full and saying, can I just pray for you in some capacity? These are easy, non-threatening questions that open up the door for you to have spiritual conversation. Do you believe that when you pray for this need that maybe they might experience God the way that Vinny experienced God when we got to pray for him? The next two minutes, we're going to take some time to listen to God, to check your calendar, and then make a plan. So I want you just to bow your heads, close your eyes. I believe that God is already starting to drop names in people's hearts. Some of you already know, and maybe you just need to, to pull out your, your pocketbook and uh, your calendar, your pocket calendar, or your, um, your phone. And you just need to look for an open date. So Jesus, right now in this moment, as we just still our hearts, we open up our minds. We open up our hearts for what you have. I pray that you'd begin to, 
to put people in our minds, to impress it on our hearts, and that we would leave here equipped with your spirit to obey, and we would trust you with the results, Lord. May we not be intimidated by whoever it is that you're asking us to reach out to. I pray that you'd prepare the soil of those that are going to be invited. You'd put people in their path that would would lead them to a place of acceptance. So Jesus, in this next minute, God, just continue to speak to our hearts. God, for those returning to you, that there would be no guilt or shame or condemnation, but you would break them free of those things, that they would come back having in confidence, not in what they do, but what you've done in the free gift of salvation, the free gift of forgiveness, not that we earn it, not that we deserve it, but that you offer it to us. And so God, I pray in this moment that people would be free of their past and they'd be able to set their eyes on you in the future. Continued with eyes closed. Is there anyone here that would say for the first time you want to ask Jesus into your life to save you? Not that he would be a part of your life, but he would be the center of your life. That he would become Lord of your life, master of your life. That you want to accept the free gift of salvation and step into the family of God as a humble servant, not earning it, not deserving it, but you'd say, Austin, for the first time, I'm asking Jesus to forgive me of my sins, come into my heart and save me today. Is there anyone here? Would you just raise your hand and look up at me if that's you? Yeah, I see you, young man. Yes, I see you. Would you just repeat this prayer just in your heart if you raise your hand? God, forgive me. Save me. Come into my life, God. Make me a new creation. New, renew my mind. Renew my heart. I need you. I want you. And I ask that you would come into my heart today to stay forever. Cleanse me of my past and guide my steps in the future, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. If you raise your hand, I'm gonna be at the Fresh Start Center, which is right out in these, these, this lobby here, and I've got some material that can help you in your walk. And I believe that many have heard from God, and, and now that we get to respond. Stick with me here, guys. I'm fully expecting amazing testimonies to start to happen in this church through shared interest groups the community table i'm fully believing that and let me encourage you to not just attend the church but to be the church i had a professor named doc watt dr watson and his comb over was as far as the east was from the west it yeah it he probably, I don't know what hairspray company it is, but I'm pretty sure he like owns stock in it because it was there. And he would always say this that left a very big impression on my heart. And I want to leave you with this thought this morning. He said this, the church is not a refrigerator meant to preserve the saints. It is a hospital for the sick, hurting, and broken. So may God bless you as you leave here this morning and may his spirit be evident in the way that you talk, in the way that you interact, be evident in your heart, soul, and mind. God bless you as you go.